through cases. Thank you. No problem. Hey, thanks for the heads up. Yeah, I'm, I'm here, Dave. I'm getting some work done at the house. and I'm running around like an idiot, but I'm here. Yeah, no, no problem. As we look at the medial foot pain case, for spend a little bit of time with that before we kind of jumped into the other one, just to kind of take them through it. I'll walk them through it, Eric, and you feel free to chime in as you uh, have things to add here. No so problem. You should, should be able to see my screen here. We have a 16-year-old female comes into clinic with complaints of right medial foot pain. It has been going on for about two months. She's a ballerina. She spends multiple hours a day per week performing dance-related activities. Pain came on insidiously. It's progressed and worsened over the last several weeks. Pain is work. Pain is worse with walking daily. Uh, with plie, salte, which I have no idea what that is, or if I even pronounced it correctly. Pain so today it's jumping. Oh, good! I got it pretty close. Sounds like something you do to meat or vegetables. Yeah, it does look like that, doesn't it? Yeah. Had an issue with Achilles tendinopathy about a year ago, which resolved with physical therapy. Again, differential diagnosis. Okay, we have medial foot pain. And Valetta, does the uh, posterior tip, which, how would you rank the one through four as Eric has them ranked here? Is there any other H1s or H hypothesis you would have? Um, Maybe like a, not that we learned them all, like a cuneiform or like cuboid subluxation. Cuboid, that's good. We're, remind me, my anatomy's gotten weaker over the years. Is, is the cuboid in the medial foot or the lateral foot? You know what? I was thinking midfoot. It is on the lateral side. Now, but midfoot, right? midfoot's fair. Like, I could put it down there as H9. Because it could be able to plant our surface once you get into it. But you're on Sorry the right track. That. Oh, no, it makes it fun for me. Yeah, actually, based on where the the mm -hmm. medial pole of the cuboid is, remember, yeah. it's it's underneath, it's lined up with the second metatarsal, right? So it is actually, the plantar surface of the cuboid is relatively mm -hmm. medial. It'd have to be very plantar and medial in order for it to be medial foot pain from that, but it's not impossible. Yeah, I would say, I could, it would make the list, but I might just put it down, down the stack a little bit. And then that first question, if it wasn't medial foot pain, how would you... You know, you can ask them to point to where the pain is and having them point to the plantar like medial surface kind of does change what we're thinking. may not eliminate posterior tib tendinopathy, but it kind of would bring that more into play versus, okay, if they point more medial, you know, medially. Makes sense. Anyone else, any other differentials you would put in this list came to mind when I started reading the case? Ryan. Yeah, can you repeat that, please? I just had a, someone cam, so I'm talking to them. No problem. Any other differentials in here? Um, not off the top of my head. I, I like that H1 a lot for this case. That, that's where my mind initially went to. Okay. Sounds good um, so far, yeah. What would, what would it look like as far as testing that? If you were to test that one individually, what would you expect to see? Um, I expect there to be some pain with some um, uh, MVIC inversion, plantar flexion type movements. Mm -hmm. And how would you test it? Um, I'd start off with them sitting kind of non-weight bearing using uh, my hand to test initially. And if that was clean, I would probably use a handheld dynamometer to test how much force they can put out um, mm -hmm. and compare that side to side. And then look at them doing a um, like a standing calf raise. Yeah, your functional test may give you more like the resistance test is good to have for your eval, but it's probably not going to differentiate posterior tip from other lesions. Just generally looking at strength it may help it, but you start to think I have a posterior tip tendinopathy. This is what I think is what tests or measures be most specific to this particular condition. Or the dynamometry is good; it's going to give you valuable data, but it doesn't necessarily help you distinguish this from Maybe one of the other ones that are up there. Because the other ones up there would probably certainly decrease force output as well. I kind of wouldn't think about it. Look at functional tests. Kevin, you're the only one here the first half. So functional tests, we have increased pain with squat, increased pain with, with left axial rotation, no pain with right axial rotation, no pain with heel raise. So working through this, you can see here what 
what is go ahead and read out what Eric's suggesting this tells us and kind of what your thoughts are on your H1. Um, so, I mean, you just said the results of the functional test. Are you thinking mm -hmm. the ankle APR? No pain yeah, with ankle active passive or resisted testing. That leads me away from a soft tissue lesion. Kind of that would move me away from that posterior tendinopathy. Mm -hmm. um, if that's all negative, no pain with uh, stability stress tests mm -hmm. or laxity. But what about those functional tests? What is that? What does that kind of tell you? I mean, Eric Carey here, he puts this suggestion over there, what it's telling you. Explain to me how he kind of comes to that conclusion that, okay. Look at my functional tests where I have pain with squat, increased pain with left axial rotation, no pain with right axial rotation, and no pain with heel raise. Explain to me a statement about this suggests that pain is worse with dorsiflexion of the ankle or with pronation of the foot. Explain to me how that statement um, relates to the functional test. Well, it might lead me to more look at anterior tib in that sense if we got pain with right rotation. Because uh, that right, right now, talk to me about what okay. do all those movements have in common when looking at, we're thinking now about what is going on at the right medial foot. So if I squat, what happens at the right medial foot? I mean, all of them stress it, all of them so. You're going into that unlocked position, basically navicular and the cuneiforms, where we get that loose pack position of the midfoot. Have um, the axial rotation to the left and the right foot. All of it should, all of it should move to the floor. That midfoot should mm -hmm. be yep. moving towards the floor, basically. Mm -hmm. That. Um, so yeah, that you know, to me would suggest more of a ligamentous thing, maybe the mm -hmm. spring ligament, um, some of those supportive ligaments on the on the underside of the midfoot. There, mm -hmm. I would start to lean towards. Yeah, what is that? No pain with heel right. raise. Start to help eliminate. To me, it 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 eliminates the active structure. So I'm moving away from muscle tendinous. Um, you know, kind of systems there mm -hmm. and Good. more passive structures, most likely. And you got into that with your active and passive resistive tests, right? And you looked at APRs that, okay, I didn't really reproduce my pain or my symptoms with that. So, you know, reducing the idea of muscular Correct. involvement. Correct. Yeah, basically when we're but looking- we go on to our... Give me one yeah, second. Go ahead. When, we're, when we're looking at these two things, so the two things that reproduce pain, Squat and left axial rotation. So it's the right foot. So left axial rotation turning away from that foot is going to pronate that right foot, right? So it's going to pronate with squat. It's going to pronate with left axial rotation. Heel raise and right axial rotation should produce supination of the right foot. So everything that's flattening out the, the right foot here is reproducing pain, okay? So we're looking at dorsiflexion, abduction, external rotation moments of the, mid, of the medial side of the foot that are reproducing the discomfort here. Mm -hmm. Did we get into stress testing of the ligament? Patrick, you don't think stress testing of the ligaments? I'm sorry, one more time, Dave. Look at stress testing of the ligaments. Now here, you know, what we're given here is that we're having no pain Relaxity with medial ankle ligament stress tests. Spring yeah. ligament, bifurcate ligament. Which is good because, you know, what is this? Which H1 does this strengthen or weaken? First, let's go with which one does it weaken? Which it weakens the spring, limit, spring yeah. ligament injury. Yep. Kind of weakens that one. Which one might it strengthen? It could strengthen up... Um, the talonavicular joint injury and it guess it could strengthen the stress test i suppose of the actual taylor neck stress fracture hmm. i don't yeah. know if the stress test on the ligament would necessarily rule that out yet yeah it, it wouldn't wouldn't yeah it doesn't, doesn't rule, help rule it out by any means unless you know it's yeah it wouldn't rule that out 
Post your tip could be could be equivocal. My guess is you start stressing along there. If it's post your tip, you may get some sensitivity, but your but your stress test on the ligaments would be normal, especially if these ligaments were collapsing. That would be your stage two or stage three posterior tip tendon dysfunction. You're going to get breakdown of this me, these medial ligamentous supporting structure. As you talk about grading, if you're looking at grading posterior tip, so these are all normal. You know, from there it's like okay, whatever it is, even if I'm still looking at posterior tip. It's not maybe a stage two dysfunction. So with that one could be a little bit equivocal. You're kind of strengthening the idea that, okay, this isn't breaking down. And with the negative heel raise or the heel raise and no pain with right axial rotation, it could be a lift of the arch. You know, that's where you're starting to think about, okay, do I have something else going on? We have Abby, Taylor swing test is negative. What does this tell us? Um, hold on. I'm actually driving. Can I like have a little skip? Pick somebody. Oh God. <laughs> um. <laughs> well, so you, like, can't pick goes... Teresa because she's not here. Uh huh. Nice try. Um. Yeah. This is brutal. How about Chan? I literally went ahead and unmuted myself because I knew <laughs> that it was coming. Thanks, Abby. Uh, so with the swing test, uh, I don't think that it's, uh, if it's negative, then it's, it's not that the, the, that it's hung in the mortise. Is that what we're saying? So that's, that that's normal. Yeah. What would a positive swing test tell you? Tell her swing test. Uh, if it's positive, um, isn't that when it's kind of hung up as far as in the, in the, in the telecrural joint that it's not, you're not getting the motion as far as, and, uh, the plantar flexion, dorsal flexion. Yeah, think of that. The yeah, it's that you know, you have intermedial, posterior, lateral, glide to the tail is at its end point there. So we know that okay, the Taylor swing test is negative. Taylor, that's really going to give us an idea of the motion at the talocrural joint. How about decreased subtalar joint? Uh, eversion looks like. You know, he's going to go as far as anterior anterior compartment with with a pathomechanical end feel. So this is going to give us a positive subtalar joint, you know, into looks like decreased into into e into e version. So this will be an inversion restriction. So you're going to be unable to uh, pronate your foot, then, correct? Yeah, that's what it sounds like. It's, it pronate the rear foot. Yep. Yep. And we have a decreased anterior talonavicular joint glide with a patho patho and a pathomechanical end feel. Those two kind of couple, or do they not couple? Are they are they congruent or incongruent? Well, I would say that they couple together. Yeah, that's what you can think you about it. Sometimes, does it be uncoupled if it's a compensation, or coupled if it's a sublux or it's a restriction? And we also have pain with a dorsal talonavicular glide. So what we have here is a navicular that won't glide dorsal and the talus. So coupled or uncoupled? I go with coupled. Yeah, to be coupled with that. You have a decreased plantar first and be glide with patho pathomechanical infill as well. So we're kind of going down the chain here. So Eric in the in the course and the same thing going with this this problem itself. Mm -hmm. Do you typically see, as far as on the medial foot, are you seeing the talonavicular and in the first ray? Typically, both of those uh, over time that you're going to kind of treat both of them. Yeah, you can see you can see any number of combination of these things together. So what we're looking at here is if you think of the foot, right? So if you're looking at the foot from the say the medial side, right, and you're thinking of how big the calcaneus is compared to the, the rest of the foot. It, it's almost the exact same size as the rest of the foot. It's at least a third of the entire foot. So if you lose eversion, the ability to evert that subtalar joint, the way that the rest of the foot from the midfoot talonavicular joint going forward has to compensate for that is everything is going to tend to go dorsally, right? Trying to flatten out um, and make up for that loss of subtalar eversion. So we can see things like what we're seeing here is the 
Uh, navicular has gone dorsal on the on the talus. The first metatarsal has gone dorsal on the cuneiforms. The cuboid has actually dropped down as the um, midline, the middle, um, the uh, sorry, the medial arch, um, longitudinal arch has started to collapse down as well. Um, so we're really seeing basically what's happening is everything from the midfoot forward here has tried to make up for the loss of subtalar eversion. So when we see this sort of process building up here as we're going down the foot and going basically from proximal to distal is we start to suspect, okay, the pain producer here becomes very, fairly obvious. When we go into a dorsal glide of the navicular on the talus, that reproduces the patient's pain, their exact pain. So that's a pretty obvious thing. And it comes up when we get to palpation. If we just palpate that joint line, that also reproduces the discomfort. So that, as far as diagnosis goes, what is our pain producer, tends to confirm for us that the talonavicular joint itself is the pain producer. The question that we have to come up with after that is why did this structure start to break down? What's the etiology? How did this happen? And the most likely situation here because of the size of the joint and the amount of stress that it's going to put on the rest of the foot then is that subtalar eversion, okay? Whether it's at the anterior compartment or the posterior compartment or however we want to view that restriction, that's very likely the thing that started to cause all of these um, dorsal subluxations that go through the the midfoot and down into the forefoot so we will see this all the time it's it's not necessarily always going to present with this exact uh kind of lineup of biomechanical issues sometimes it'll have sometimes it'll be different we'll see things at the cuneiforms we'll th see things um without the uh, cuboid involvement things of that sort of nature a lot of times it'll depend on um, kind of the chronicity of the problem how long has it been there um, but yeah, we will see this sort of exact sequela of issues that'll start to build up um, quite a bit, especially somebody that does a lot of um, active up and down, right? So when somebody's doing ballet, they put a lot of stress on their foot in general, right? So it 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 tends to break these things down even faster than it would if somebody was, say, um, you know, if they're uh, kind of personal activity, their exercise for the day was sitting on an exercise bike. They're less likely to have this sort of um, scene start to build up as their as their problem, just because they they've got different stresses going through the foot, right? But in her situation, based on her meaningful task, this stuff tends to become much more problematic much quicker. That all makes sense. It does, Eric. Thank you. Yeah, that's what it says. Once you find it, then it's like yeah, you can find any variation of these things that can go on there. So it's keeping that open mind as you go to look at them, know that, okay, well, you don't find this exact pattern. It's like, well, it can't be it. It's like all the compensation could be at the tail and navicular joint, or it could be more in the forefoot, or maybe it's in the lateral foot. You know, you can see any manifestation around this, depending on chronicity, the motor pattern will change around it. How they yeah. recruit the system will automatically, you can assume that you're going to have compensations and the neural recruitment patterns. You know, one, because you have pain, two, because you can't move in and flow through the normal inversion to eversion moment with an early stance. Yeah, this is this is a nice uh, profile for us to run into because these are simple biomechanical problems that we can find and fix. You know, imagine if this was a patient that came in and we started finding fatigable weakness that would affect the um, intrinsic muscles of the foot. You know, something along those lines, S1, S2, starting to find out, oh, this thing's looking like it's, uh, there's some neurological issues here that's affecting the support of the foot. That's a much more difficult problem for us to come in and, and deal with. Because um, now all of a sudden we're having to chase down, is this peripheral, is this radicular or segmental? Um, you know, is there upper motor neuron components that are coming into play here? So th there's there's other possibilities that come into play. Um that are less common, but certainly we have to take them into consideration, right? So when we're looking at etiologies, we could put down any number of things as possibilities. Um, if the ankle happened to be stiff, could that have still been causing part of the problem? Yeah, sure. It could have easily been in increasing the stress on the tail and navicular joint. We could have had issues with the hip, for instance, that would have increased stress across the foot. Um, this is This just tends to be a very common profile where most of the mm -hmm biomechanical issues are local. They're, they're nearby.
right? So this this is good. We we find this stuff path mechanical end feels great, fantastic. Yeah. We can do some manipulations here, and we can get this stuff moving pretty quick. Take some stress off of that sore joint, and and we can just start rolling with getting this person back to activity. Um, but if we start finding more complicated things, um, you know, like say for uh, fatigable weaknesses or something along that line, our our initial thought process are starting to go out the window of how we're going to treat this thing. Yeah, I always remember too is like you know when they fuse the well, we're looking at fusing the subtalar joint. They do the tail and navicular joint. You cannot separate out tailor motion, tailor navicular motion from subtalar joint motion. So having this eversion, you know, subluxation, well, that loss of inversion, and not being able to move properly between them, it's going to always impact tail and navicular joint motion as a compensatory or stress thing. So yep. it's just it's very, it's very normal in your mind. Just know that okay, if I have something in the in the subtalar joint, there's gonna be impact you know, in the midfoot. Absolutely. I've got that midfoot pain. You know, okay, you absolutely have to look at the subtalar joint to understand what the midfoot is doing. So we get into here, you know, diagnosis here is a you know talonavicular joint injury. Here he finds the dorsal subluxation of the talonavicular joint due to decreased subtalar, you know, eversion. So how does this likely push the, uh, again, the scalar navicular joint into the dorsal position? Stephanie's dying to answer this one, I can tell. Can you repeat that again, Dave? Sure. I'm going to read the red box that Eric has over here on the right-hand side. Think, okay, what, what is likely to force the, the navicular into a dorsal position? How does how does the sub the loss of subtalar joint eversion force the uh, navicular dorsal? That's a good question. It is, isn't it? That's a good question. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'd have to think on that one for a little bit. I'm honestly not too sure. It's interesting this concept. That's why it's it, it's good because even for me, it's like you know, it gives you a moment to pause on what what would be the mechanism to do this. They are talking about it. it's like what we want to do is we need to get the we need to get the big toe to the floor, and the ground. So if I have a loss of of eversion, I'm stuck inverted. You know, you're going to get this tilt of the foot up there. So what what does it do is then collapse. So what will happen is you look at the subtalar joint as a unit almost. You know, you watch the foot almost tilt. Or, or evert the entire subtalar joint to get the big toe down, or you're going to have to reach with the big toe. So normally what's going to happen with this is you're going to drive the subtalar or the talus down and in on the navicular versus normally what happens is, is as the heel moves, the talus kind of collides on top of it. So the model I often have when I see this is that I've lost this. The talus won't, won't evert there. So the whole rear foot's going to stretch the drive toward the ground. That, that, that drives the navicular dorsal on the, uh, of course, because that becomes the motion segment. So since you don't have the motion segment in the rear foot, you bump it up to the next joint in the chain, which is going to be the halo navicular joint. Yeah, imagine imagine if you put a wedge with the, the wide end of the wedge underneath the calcaneus, right? So basically, if the, the wide end of the wedge is on the medial side of the foot, What's and you put it underneath the and you put it underneath the heel, it's not going to allow that heel to evert, right? It's going to hold that heel up, and that's exactly what an inversion subluxation is doing. So what's going to happen beyond that is now you're going to get the the talus is going to have to try and push itself downward, and we're going to have to try and lift the navicular superiorly to allow that midfoot, that medial side of the midfoot, to flatten out and to absorb body weight, to stretch the different ligaments of the foot. And that, that these are all things that have to happen in order for us to pa generate passive energy and also to set the first metatarsal head in, onto the ground. So if we can't do that through the rear foot, we have to do all of that through the midfoot and through the forefoot. And so it just puts a ton of extra stress because like I said, the, the heel is so big in comparison to all the other bones and all the other joints of the, of the foot itself you start losing that it's very difficult for the rest of the foot to make up for it. If we think about um, we've talked a bit about the, the AA joint 
in the neck and how mobile it is. It's the most mobile spinal segment that we have. So if we lose the ability to rotate the head at the AA joint, trying to make up for that at any of the other joints of the cervical spine um, or any other joints of the spine in general, we're just never going to be able to make up that amount of motion. So we're going to start breaking things down as we try and compensate for that. It's the exact same thing that's happening here. The rear foot, the subtalar joint is so integral to things like pronation um, during weight bearing activity that if we lose that, something down in the, down the chain. So something in the midfoot, something in the forefoot is going to take that stress. It has to, there's no way around it. It's just a matter of how often does this person stress that sort of thing. Like I said, if there's somebody that sits at a desk all day and their exercise is, is sitting on a spin bike, they may not have this issue right off the bat. It may take some time, but somebody that is on their feet all day, um, say like we've talked about the uh, uh, factory worker, we've talked about the uh, cashier at a grocery store, somebody that's on their feet all day, kind of rotating back and forth. Um, somebody whose activity is in weight bearing, a, uh, somebody that's a jogger, or a runner, somebody that does ballet, like this particular patient, they're on their feet a ton. So these joints are going to take a ton of stress. They're going to break down much faster. Um, so that that's the way I think about it is just, we, we've lost this amount of mobility, a substantial amount of mobility, and the body has to find a way to make up for it. And if it has to do that for prolonged periods, then something eventually is going to exceed the adaptive potential that it has. And when that happens, that's when things start to become painful. Yeah. Stephanie, hey, I'm not sure, and I don't know, great answer to you, by the way. And we'll joke around a little bit here, but don't be shy about, hey, I just, my mind hasn't put it all together yet, because we'll talk through it. It's just good to think about it for a second or two as it comes up and say, hmm, what comes to my mind, but. Anyone yeah, I was going to say, it all makes sense when we're talking through it, but we did not go nearly this in depth in PT school. So just kind of, it's helpful mm -hmm. to have it explained and kind of talked through because um, yeah. I've never had that um, experience before. So thank you. I appreciate yeah. it. Yeah, well, no, that's, one of, hey, ahead, that's the point of doing these things, right? Is, you know, this is, this is how it looks when we see it in clinic. And this is, this is hopefully the way you guys are going to start seeing patients when they walk in the door, they're going to give you their little um, you know, subjective spiel. They're going to tell you what's going on. You know, I'm 16 years old. I'm a ballerina. Hurts when I when I walk or hurts when I do these activities during ballet class. And your head should immediately start going to these potential hypotheses, right? Okay, well, what do I know is on the medial side of the foot? Well, it could be posterior tip, could be a tail and avicular joint, could be, um, you know, a, a tailor neck stress fracture. It could be the tail and avicular joint itself. It could be a medial uh, you know, deltoid ligament strain of some sort. It could be, you know, you can start rattling through these things. And then your line of questioning should start changing the probabilities that you see, right? Every question that you ask should be something that helps you differentiate between the potential hypotheses that you have. So if you bring in a sheet of paper or even your computer and you pull up something, you just start immediately typing these things down, right? Here's my options. Here's the options that I've come up with right off the bat. Questions should lead you closer to one of them than the others. And then once you have a, once you have an idea and you're thinking like, okay, my based on the questions and the way that they answered these questions, it's going to make me lean. My probability now is much higher that this issue is a talonavicular joint problem. Then your tests that you do should be aimed at confirming that particular hypothesis, right? And potentially ruling out the others. Okay, so and then once you're there, once you find your your uh, pain producer, that that uh, diagnosis that we're looking for, then it's all about okay, how did this thing break down? I know the direction that the pain is caught is happening in is if I push this into a dorsal glide, what's going to increase dorsal glide of this particular segment? All right, then you can start looking at the other findings that you have, the other biomechanical things that popped up during the examination. You can say, okay, which one of these would potentially do that? Which one of these would force this into that sort of position consistently? And once you find that, it's like, all right, great. I know where I'm at. I, I know exactly where I'm going to go. Your treatment of choice listed right down here, it should start lining up very quickly. Okay. If I, the etiology, the, the, the driving factor here, that subtalar eversion loss, that's got to come off the board first. Boom. We do that. Then any of these other potential uh, contributing factors, can start coming off the board. Tail and avicular joint issue, we can we can work on that. First metatarsal, cuboid, 
All right, those are gone. And then we're into our re-education um, or, or rehab components, looking at, uh, you know, re-educating ankle foot sensory feedback. This is basically trying to get the uh, musculature around the foot and in the ankle and whatnot to fire appropriately. I'll tell you right off the bat, when we have um, difficulties with tarsal joints, things like the cuboid, things like the cuneiforms, first metatarsal, et cetera, we're going to have difficulty kind of processing the sensory feedback that we get from the foot, pressure reception, vibratory reception, these sort of things that tell the muscles of the foot and the ankle uh, and you know, essentially the entire lower leg that they need to turn on, right? Because when I, when we shift our weight side to side, it changes where the pressure is over the, over the surface of the, the plantar surface of the foot. And those, those muscles have to be reactive and they're not going to be very reactive effectively if they're painful, right? We're, we're going to have that muddied signal. So we have to re-educate that sort of thing. And then when we're looking at doing, you know, the ability for this person to get back to activity, improving some sort of supination stability, um, you know, getting them back toward being on point, which is one of the major things that, uh, ballerinas obviously have to be able to do we, we start doing some different things with that sort of thing and that, this will change those last two things four and five will tend to change based on the activity that the patient's trying to get back to Dave, you anything to add with the sequence there yeah i think this is really really well outlined just going from that's exactly what i'm going to go in there subtalar joint is probably the primary driver because that'll impact the tail individual joint kind of working through those and then you're right all your time then it's going to be one in one through three is going to be the smallest portion of your time. It had the yeah. most impact, but it's the smallest portion of your time. You may find by session two, you've cleaned up one through three. They're going to spend special session two through eight on four to five. Because that's the harder part is to get that system rewired. Because what's driving this foot into that position? The pattern you knew they have that may have created this. So first is get it, trying to get it leveled. And then can I rebuild that pattern? I think the tempo sets in there are kind of that key point as well. For this person who being a dancer is, what is she doing at tempo? And can she at tempo or dancing pace control the foot? Is there something in there that's creating this problem? So it just doesn't, okay, I fix all these things and she's good for a week and she dances for two weeks and it's back because the pattern hasn't changed. Yeah. So, tempo sets are fantastic because mm -hmm. basically when I'm using tempo, I'm just changing the duration of a particular exercise. So I'm looking at slowing things down beyond six seconds, right? We, we go beyond six seconds. We've already burned through the first group of motor units, right? Mm -hmm. So when we, we've talked about this previously, but it's still, it still applies here, even in the periphery. If we perform a particular muscle contraction, Typically, that's going to fire about 60% of the motor units in that particular muscle. And then the, the other 40% is left in reserve for sustained or, or uh, repetitive contractions, right? So if we go through an exercise and the, ex and the motion takes longer than six seconds to get through, we've already burned through the ATP for the first 60% of, of those motor units. So we know at that point we're using the entirety of that muscle, right? We're getting the entire 100% cycling through these things at tempo, which is great because that means we're re-educating the whole thing and not just maybe the first 60% of the thing, right? So this is that's, that's a great way sometimes to use um, just the change in speed of an exercise to help with that rehab uh, component because it's, it's something that we don't think about too much. Um, I think, I think a lot of us are just like, well, let's get this thing going. Let's get some repetitions done here. Let's get this thing stronger. Um, but it's, it's not always as easy as that. We have to look at some of that neural neuromuscular output that comes in with, uh, stability, with repetitive activity, with sustained loads. Um, so I really like tempo sets. I use them a ton in my, you know, quote unquote rehab components, you know, the exercise re-education components, but Dave's totally right. One through three, that's going to take me three minutes to do. You know, if this patient's in my office for 40 minutes, I'm, I'm working the next 37, 35, 37 minutes on four and five every time they come in. Yeah, it's, it's going to be a bit of a misnomer. Like, oh, man, I just manipulate these things, and then they're good to go. I send them on their way. And two visits, I'm done. But it's really kind of almost does them a disservice because you probably have not into what are the patterns. Let's kind of get the same thing looking at back motor retraining where okay multifidi are inhibited i manipulate them their pain goes away 
you know, but do I still have atrophy and inhibition of the back muscles? Have I properly retrained it? Have I re-coordinated their system? You know, ankle stability, I think, I kind of think, we think along the same routes that this is the easy stuff, but just because I got your pain away, that's kind of, you need to kind of reset this whole system. The system's going to fire correct. And that's where you're in visit, you know, three through eight or three through 10. Yeah. And you'd be surprised how often patients continue to do those sort of things after they're done with you too. Cause they're like, boy, you know, it being like for this ballerina in particular, it's just like, it's so much easier to be up on point and to be, you know, going through releve and all these different movements that involve pronation to supination of the foot. They're just like, it feels so much easier. It feels like there's so much less stress because their coordination of their foot has become so much better just from doing these things. So it, it becomes a, almost a performance enhancing type of activity for them as well after a while, which is great. And the cool thing is like, it's the early stage and you get in here. It's like, I don't know ahead of time what's going on with your foot. Ligamented stress test, biomechanical exam, you know, a, a active passive resistive and you've got all the information and then you can back work it. You're in there now and you think, okay, well, I found a couple of these restricted joints, you know, boy, is this the driver that tailored your vicar painful one. Let me treat what I found and see what the response is. Test retest model. So, you know, you don't need to have this all in the forefront of your mind when you're at the initial history. You know that, okay, with time I can go through and I can test these things. I can gather this information. Treat what I find and test retest. Oh, look, okay, that creates a significant difference. Okay, now I know I need the normal muscular re-ed and root stability and tempo work. You don't have it at the top, you know, just know that you can hunker down and do what you've learned and you can get to that end point. And again, by module eight, as we practice this four or five, you know, four more sessions or so, you know, then this becomes a little bit more rote. You're going to get a lot of repetition of this process as we go on. And again, literally, this is kind of, if you looked at this, okay, if anyone who's worried about a practical, bam, there it is. Yep, this is it. This is how it looks. So you're going to do so much of this between now and then, you know, it's going to, it's going to be second nature. I missed last week and y'all may have discussed it last week uh, with the zoom session, you know, Eric, and I don't, I know we talked about manipulations and uh, indications, contraindications. Is there a foot that you just sit there and say, Hey, I'm not going to manipulate this or, um, you know, obviously with the thoracic spine, we had the test of uh, spring test. Uh, the uh, foot. Yeah. There there's, possibilities of of not being able to manipulate a foot so somebody that has um you know real bad circulation issues somebody that comes in they've got real bad you know diabetic issues things of that sort of nature where you're looking at you know what's the vascular component here mm -hmm. any structural things that are that you're you know concerned with patients that have um you know bone weakening diseases things like pages or real significant osteoporosis things of that sort of nature you may decline to do some of these sort of things um, at high velocity anyway, or high acceleration. Yeah. So there, there's definitely some things that, that come out like that. And you have to take it into consideration that the patient's entire, you know, constitutional ability to withstand those sort of, those sort of forces in general. Um, so it could happen in, in particular. And, and the, the list of contraindications that we have are kind of like that, you know, it's just like, well, you know, so if there's potential for neurovascular damage, things of that sort of nature, potential for structural damage, um, all those sort of things play a role in making those sort of decisions. But somebody that comes in that's 16, um, you know, healthy otherwise, doesn't have any other constitutional issues, you're not going to get too concerned with any of this sort of stuff. Um, as far as other tests that you may do, we talked about with like the ankle, for instance, if you find laxity of the anterior ankle ligaments, so either the ATFL or the anterior band of the deltoid, you may not want to do something like a pure traction technique for the talo uh, curl joint. Um, just because you, if you pull them into a plantar flex position, you may end up stressing those already damaged ligaments. So you'd, you'd move into um, potentially using a J stroke where you're going to actually bring them more toward a dorsiflexion position and then produce a bit of more of a posterior glide. That's going to give you a bit more slack on those potentially dim, uh, damaged uh, anterior ligaments, things of that sort of nature. Um, it's not as cut and dry as it is with the spinal stuff. Um, as far as what would be a indication that you would find that would say, let's not manipulate this. 
um, the thoracic spine, especially when, if we have instability, we, the body, the segments can't handle posterior shear. We have, um, cord signs, you know, so we have positive upper motor neuron signs, um, Babinski, et cetera, clonus, those sort of things. Now, a positive rib spring test that would suggest rigidity where we could actually damage something. Those things are pretty universal. They're red flag problems. Um, and if we find those in the thorax, then it's just, yeah, we, we can't do that technique on this particular person. It's not quite the same in the foot, um, although there would be, you know, potential accumulation of things, mostly constitutional problems that the patient would have that uh, that may lead you away from that. Yeah, that's where you use your applied biomechanics. Okay, I may not be manipulating this person. Somebody's just got feels like, okay, I can, I can apply traction, mobilization. You know, I can take, how can I get this joint in the position I want to work it into? You know, just using the applied biomechanics. Right, where I'm just not feeling it, whether it's systemic arthropathy. I think they weak bones. I don't want to use that force on that. I got to step away for a second. The guy working downstairs needs my... All right. Those of you who saw the presentation that Jim did, I'm going to go over it. He really talks about, you know, what are the major and minor SI joint lesions that he goes into. Look at, you know, testing. Jim kind of broke it down into different categories of, you know, Fortin's, Fortin's test is one, you know, one too. And that's basically just a finger point test. You know, that person, if they take one finger and they can point to their SI joint, and it's positive for, I'm going to take a look at the SI joint as being the primary pain generator. Now, the general rule of thumb, as we get an SI joint is that when you think it's the SI joint, you know, always go back and double check the lumbar spine. More often than not, it's going to be lumbar referral rather than primary SI joint. And if it is a primary SI joint, should be able to, it should stand out as being different. Like when I do the test, it's not vague. And again, we go in the objective tests, primary stress test, secondary stress test, kinetic test. We're going to do a lot of that during the course. So we don't need to go into too much detail. A good way to start to understand this is as primary stress tests that Jim talks about are your anterior posterior gapping stress tests, you know, and there's the he also get into the hop test or heel drop test, which is like a vertical trauma test to it. You're basically when you're dropping down onto your heel and loading, can the SI joint does that reproduce the pain, you know, localized in the SI joint, as well as gapping the joints, so like compression, traction of the joints or compressing the joints also some ligamentous stress that goes on with this these tests are positive you know for si joint pain you know many times you don't need to go much you know you're going to kind of really going to solidify your your answer many times you're going to get into that and you think man this is si joint pain you enter post your gapping i maybe my biomechanical stress test of the si joint and it's not reproducing my pain that i'm generally kind of coming back up either into the lumbar spine or we'll get into just dynamic dysfunctions, which you may see. So primary stress tests are one that are stressing the joints themselves. Does it reproduce pain when I compress this joint? Secondary stress tests, or it's really you're looking for, as I do my second, it's your biomechanical tests. And I believe I did a little bit of this in M1, and we'll get a lot more into it in M5. This is where, do I have excessive movement at the SI joint where I should have very little? Or do I have reproduction of, you know, severe pain or significant pain as I do a secondary stress test on the ligament? So these are stress tests that will be designed to look at the, the ligamentous ability. Now, you know, you're going to find this variation. You may find the postpartum female and have a little bit more lax, you know, ligamentous stability here. And, you know, you know, where is that within normal range or fix? If I have her and she's 10 years postpartum and I have a SI joint, and my left side has more of the larger R1, my first resistance than the other side. Okay. That's going to be finding where now I know that she needs a better motor system to these secondary stress tests are useful and not so much in looking at the itises and the acute inflammation conditions of maybe the SI joint, but hey, I'm getting a secondary stress of this joint, and I have to load the system. And we're in your kinetic tests, you know, we're all probably very familiar with some of the standing tests that we do for this, you know, you know, 
those tests are good. There are, there are some difficulties sometimes with them because you are palpating through multifidi many times when you're doing this. So changes in multifidi, bulk and tone can, uh, can influence these tests. You know, we'll get into a bit of the Portland in this one, which is kind of a dynamic SI joint stabilizing test as well of how well can I dynamically control my SI joint. Again, I'm going to leave these tests for the course a little bit later on, but I wanted to explain in the, from the video what you saw is how do I kind of frame this out? Primary stress tests, can I gap this joint? Does it reproduce pain when I do this? Does the shearing force of a heel drop or hop test irritate it? When I assess the biomechanical mobility, is there excessive motion? Is there a complete loss of motion at the joint? And I'm comparing right and left. And I have my kinetic tests. We'll talk about it many times. Sometimes you're going to get in the secondary stress test and there's biomechanical exams, the information that you're looking for in the kinetic test. I know over the years I've developed, you know, I think Eric does it a little differently, which is great. You know, I rely on my secondary stress test, my biomechanical exam, give me a lot of the information. And then I may look at the standing kinetic tests. And that tells me dynamically, can they stabilize the pelvis? But I like to look at the biomechanics to see what, what do I have at baseline? And what do I see with movement and loading? And that's where the kinetic tests give me that little bit of information of how does this pelvis respond differently under a load. You know, pathologies, you know, very clear as Jim outlines that, you know, big things we're looking for here, visceral disease, you know, referred pain we're looking at. By visceral disease, you know, I'm going to get referral back in. And that individual, you know, again, my mechanical exam should be somewhat equivocal when I do it. They may feel better with motion. It's going to be constant pain, pain after after meals. If I'm looking at that, if it's gastrointestinal, it's kind of a key cue we're looking at. Pain that doesn't change. You know, tumor and tumor pain. We're really looking at there is the classics. Okay, do I have pain that's not responding to physical therapy? Pain that doesn't change with necessarily uh, you know movements tumor in the bone, then it is going to have more of a musculoskeletal feel. Pain may be more constant with all activities. You know, maybe they're present at night. You know, fractures, you know, through the bone, avulsions and falls. You know, the ones I've seen mostly with fractures have been, you know, again, trauma, the, the falls, bike wrecks, things of that nature. I've seen stress fractures in runners. You know, I've seen it in 45-year-old you know, marathon and you know, long distance triathletes, eat it in high school, college runners occasionally in there, but it's not very common to see sacral fractures and pelvic stress fractures. But again, you kind of you kind of get a sense of it. I've seen far more femoral neck stress fractures than I have sacral fractures. Anyone out there has seen sacral fractures due to stress or other causes? I'm actually supposed to have an evaluation um, of a 12 year old with um, a pubic fracture. Um, I don't have a lot of information on it, but I don't I don't know if it would be like possibly like an avulsion fracture or um, I'm not sure. So I guess we'll see what what that eval looks like. That'll be it'll be interesting to see what it causes. You know, with 12 years old, I assume probably traumatic. Would be hard thing to yeah, I was thinking that. maybe like a gymnast or something. So maybe something traumatic or, yeah. or I'm not sure. Updates to come. Yeah, no, I look forward to hearing it. And you're right, or are you know, we looking at a vulture? Probably what are we looking at there? Uh, Dr. Munsell potentially. Anyone else? Any any pelvic fractures, sacral fractures? You know, Mine enough, they're all are, are not stress fractures. They're all uh, injuries or avulsion fractures. Yeah. So avulsion, you're probably seeing somebody who's probably fall or sports, you know, again, the traumatic ones, you know, I've seen bikers over the years. So bike wrecks, you know, not, you know, I've seen those all different variety. I had a guy, I didn't see him for too long. He ended up in the hospital and I unfortunately don't know what happened to him after that, but he was a college, um, runner and, mm -hmm very unfortunately underweight um for how much running he was doing so nutritional deficits um and he got a bone density test done like a dexa scan and he was low for his age and his mm -hmm. age um, and for being a male as well um but yeah they were suspecting that he had a fracture um 
but he unfortunately canceled his appointments because he was in the hospital and I haven't seen him since. Yeah, they they probably put him on rest. Mm -hmm. Shut him yeah, down I for a period of time. So. Yeah, I only saw him for like a couple visits. Um, yeah. but yeah, it wasn't wasn't looking too good for him, unfortunately. The tricky and severe. It's like, you know, if you see that individual and he's got you know, moderate to severe SI joint pain, it's very typical in a male runner of that age. So it's gotta be in the back of your mind. It's not the first thing I'm gonna think of, but it's something that's kind of back in there, like especially when he's frail, like the guy I saw went on went on went on to run at Oregon. So he was an elite, same thing, high school guy, very, you know, small for a size, elite runner. You know, and again, very, very top level. So high, high level of stress at that age. Probably very similar. Probably had a low bone density, which I don't know. You know, fractures, as we call it, those are going to have the classic signs of fracture. You're going to see the runners, those athletes, those will be the trickier ones. You know, sacroiliitis, when we see this, I mean, you know, classic one is, you know, maybe if you've seen sacroiliitis, about 40, 50 year old female, common one you may see with that. You know, Jim will talk about if you're looking at SI joint versus biomechanical, it's that idea that straight leg raise will pull it maybe 60 or above. You know, you can do the, the bent knee raise, which will give a more range of motion. And we also have, you know, basically your, you know, your septic, you know, your septic sacroiliitis, you know, cause of infection. And, you know, certainly your system, your systemic, you know, sacroiliitis, you know, you're looking there at, you know, Crohn's disease, you know, writers or other other disorders that would cause, you know, your ankylosing, spondylitis, fear, it's more systemic causes of it. And that's just kind of where you get to profile. So if you see this in somebody and they're they're not matching a uh, normal history of this, they're younger, younger male, where you may think, okay, ankylosing spondylitis, you know, female, you know, history of infection or other joint arthropathies. You know, that's where you're thinking, okay, do I have something in systemic? If I'm thinking of pure inflammation without trauma or there, you know, somewhere in the back of my mind, I got to be playing off. Do I have enough of a history here or something that may be suggesting something more systemic if I'm having a sacroiliitis, in which case my primary stress tests are positive. All the normal ones you do, your lazlet cluster be positive. Any systemic arthropathies out there? Anybody have oh, yeah. seen one in the past? I've seen plenty of them. Mm -hmm. Seen them. I don't know that I've seen. I've not seen a ton of them. But you see them come across, and it just how would you describe it, Eric? Just sometimes they look and feel different. Like you know, this isn't just purely biomechanical. Something more when I yeah, see it, it they they. Out. They tend to have really odd presentations. You know, they come in, they complain of like 400 different things. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and you start wondering if everything they're telling you is true or if they're they're just, you know, looking for sympathy or something like that. But, you know, you start getting into the testing, especially if they're acute. Um, I've had a couple of patients with Anki Spawn come in um, previously and they it, it's just like everything bothers them. You know, you ask them to bend forward, you ask them to lean back, you go side to side, all these, you know, you go through your typical evaluation process and it's more like look going through a scan because the, the profile that they present with doesn't really match up with anything, um, you know, any type of typical pattern that you'd see. But then you start seeing these kind of gross limitations um, and, you know, kind of nondescript limitations that they're, they're going to be limited in almost every movement because almost every joint has become inflamed and never, almost every joint has some sort of capsular limitation to it at that point. So if somebody comes in with a, uh, you know, systemic sacroiliitis, um, it, it, it's bad when they walk, it's bad when they get out of bed, it's bad when they bend down, it's bad when they sit for too long, you know, so it, it ends up being kind of a very, very functionally limiting problem. But then you start catching on to like, well, they're limited in every direction. Everything just looks stiff. Everything looks kind of kind of gummy in every sort of different direction. So it, it there are certain things that you can ask them about specifically with these sort of issues because they'll tend to have very notable fascial uh, irritation when they're in acute flare up. So things like uh, uh, conjunctivitis, they'll have, you know, pain in their eyes or itching sensations in their eyes. When they get this, they'll get fascial issues in the bottom of in both feet and both, in both palms of the hand. 
um, from the planner fashion and the fashion that in the palm of the hand. And then they'll also typically have um, like a urethritis, some sort of pain or burning on urination. Um, and it's just from an irritation and inflammation of the type of tissue that the urethra is composed of. Um, if it's somebody that comes in that has like an ulcerative colitis, some of their issues will be related to um, food consumption as well. So you can start asking questions about those sort of things. And it's pretty consistent where you'll run into, they'll have that sort of triad of other issues. Um, and if they haven't been diagnosed with a systemic condition at that point, that's probably a good point to kind of get them referred over to a rheumatologist for some testing for that sort of stuff. Well, given the time, this isn't a bad stopping point because we're going to get into the micro macros and biomechanicals in the next few uh Give me some feedback. Email me if you like the first case. If you want to see more of that? If you want to see less of it? Let me know too. And uh, we'll kind of keep going from there. I will try and put out a uh, schedule for the next zooms leading up to M five coming up uh, hopefully by the weekend. Let's see where I am. Dave, this really helped. I think we should go through more cases. In my personal opinion. Okay. I know I don't speak for everyone, but that's just how I feel. That's not true. We all know you speak for everyone. I totally agree. <laughs> this was helpful. Yeah, I think it's a great process. I just want to make sure I'm reading it right. And reading the room, you know, sometimes you can't read the room right. But I think it's a really good thing to do. So I think it's you'll see that just helps train the mind. But I hate the idea of you leave that topic and then you just go on to something new and you don't get a chance to reinforce it. So Yeah. Well, and I think for me personally, I think the 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 grand scheme here, what we want to get you guys doing is get you better at seeing things in clinic. And if we don't kind of show you what it looks like in clinic, then it's hard for you to really get better at doing it. And like we get, we get so narrowed down and especially in module four with all these hands-on techniques and just, 